And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the old fashions flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This interview is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at www.paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by... Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Awesome, but for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an old-fashioned, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, a man who needs no introduction after almost nine years? Damn. Nine years. Nine years. Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. Very excited to be here tonight. We've got a fabulous interview for you, and Jack, Joff, and myself are going to talk about stories for the week. And here in studio, our resident bartender and host, <laughs> Mr. Jack Daniel. That's me. Welcome, Jack. It's fabulous, yourself. fabulous old fashions. <coughs> Variation on an old fashion. It's like an old new fashion. Right, right. So mm. Yeah, so you, we've played Maybe with this, and you've jingling. played with it. It's... Uh, um, oh, black put maple walnut bitters. Yeah, yeah, so just that's the Defee Brothers. Uh, our our friend uh, oh. Deviant loves that. And also, if you want a little more complexity, add uh, instead of st- going straight for a rye or bourbon, do a little uh, a splash. Oh, should put a splash of rum in there. Splash too? of rum in there. So find this a splash of rum in a cocktail, Jack. That's and a secret. Th- th- for these things, the, you go for a, a whiskey-like rum. So mm. something like a Ron Zacapa or. Uh, uh, the black barrel stuff from Mountain mm-hmm. Gay. Um, not a lot, you know, maybe, maybe half an ounce to t- one and a half ounces of your favorite uh, bourbon or rye for old fashions. And it uh, adds some complexity. Um, it does. And, uh, but, uh, so we have uh, some announcements there, and then we got some. We have Joff. To. We'll be Joff on oh, the line. Oh, that's right. We got guys. Joff on the line. Hello, Joff. And he's got a cocktail of his own there. He does. He has a cocktail concoction. I, I do. G'day, g'day, everybody. It's good to see you again. Um, I am drinking a uh, just a good old fashioned gin and tonic. Not a good old fashioned. Uh, however, um, I, I don't nearly have the amazing skills that Jack has to make these things. So uh, I just get get by as best I can. But show four hundred. I'm expecting big times on uh, uh, in the uh, in the domestic bar making. What, uh, hey, show I don't know, yes. What yes, show four hundred. Father Christmas will be tending bar. There you go. That, um, I'm glad to hear that. So that'll be happening yeah, on so December everybody 19th. Everybody, stay tuned. Show 400 is coming up right before the Christmas break. We'll be looking forward to it. We've uh, identified uh, guests we want to reach out to. If you're interested in participating in episode 400 and want to help us celebrate our 400th episode, you can email psw at securityweekly.com. Uh, we've got some panels that we want to fill up. So uh, I want to talk about give people a sneak preview. Go figure, I want to talk about the Internet of Things. Though I don't really want to call it the Internet of Things. I want to talk about the Internet of Things. And then I want to talk about... I came up with the title. Chris, do you remember what the title I came up with? The title was freaking brilliant. It was about like how all these old vulnerabilities that have been in code for 19 years are resurfacing and becoming a big deal. I didn't want to call it the Heartbleed Shell Shock Sandworm. Panel. And uh, Paul, you poodle, should write these things poodle down. Poodle fart. The yeah, poodle, poodle fart. Poodle fart. Poodle, poodle fart. Heart. There's been some awful names. Poodle like heart poodle? fart. Who, who, who the heck came up with that one? <laughs> it had it had a good name, and I'll come up with some, some topics for that panel. And since we're 
dedicating episode 400 to the EFF, um, we're going to do a, a privacy panel. We won't have a privacy panel like to get changed behind. I mean, we're going to have like a bunch of people on talking about privacy. Which will be that's why we have the table drapes, though, because that's kind of the privacy panel. It is our because, privacy panel. Um, yes. you, you don't know what's under the table, and you don't want to. I am not wearing pants. That's, so. that's yes. Um, so <laughs> that'll be episode 400. There'll be cocktails, and we've got all kinds of stuff in stores. Not much <laughs> to see. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I th- <laughs> excuse me. I think the SteelCon competition is still happening. Enter to win a security tube cra- training course. Even you must write documentation for an open source project. Details can be found on the link in the show notes. Larry, who could not be with us tonight, is teaching Sans Wireless 617 Ethical Hacking and Defense coming up in Orlando, April 11th through the 18th and in germany june 22nd through the 27th our special guest for this evening is elliot brink who is an information security consultant based out of chicago he's an avid security enthusiast enthusiast even uh particular interest in honeypots and social engineering elliot performs internal and external penetration assessments on social engineering engagements he likes old tech like a computer history museum and well-crafted Bloody Marys and seeing new places. Elliot can be found on Twitter at E. Brinkster. Elliot, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be on. Uh, I saw your presentation at GurCon, and I thought we should hang out because we love honeypots and active defense type of technologies. Uh, I thought it was very good, so I uh, wanted you to come on the show. Elliot, tell us how you get your start in information security. Um, you know, really just something I was doing as a kid, uh, and it, in school, I was originally studying, uh, just business, uh, business IT Yeah. and kind of as time went on, you know, I had the whole help desk job thing, which was fun. And then it escalated to, you know, owning a small domain and having control and, and being in charge of the security of that. And then as I was on my way out of school, I thought, you know, I just started a research security and uh, started right out of school. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, Elliot, how did you get started with uh, with honeypots? So that's a fun story because originally, originally the whole Kippo project that I had was only to to capture passwords. So I, you know, I, I wanted to make a good word list. I, you know, I wanted to be able to. Uh, brute force passwords effectively and i you know you can find dictionaries on the internet you can generate your own but ultimately it it started as i just want to collect stuff from other people because if you know i have the opportunity to just take the materials that someone else is brute forcing against my system i might as well do that so that's kind of how it it ended up getting started and then it became a a whole lot more (laughs) yeah and then it kind of grew uh from there like a lot and you yeah. started analyzing what attackers were doing in your honeypots, right? Yeah. Um, at first, you know, it, at first uh, month or so, it was just quiet brute forcing, uh, you know, ver- varying lengths of, uh, you know, a couple characters to obnoxiously large. But then I knew eventually that they were gonna they were gonna log on. You know, Kippo, the the honeypot that I utilize, lets you uh, fake a Linux system. Uh, by default, it's a it's a Debian system, and they went on. They would you know they would go on. They nine out of ten times they're just doing a wget file. They run it and they leave. And I, I started going and, and tracing those to their origin, and I find out, found a lot more than I was expecting. What kind of things? Uh, you had some very interesting things in your presentation, Elliot. What kinds of things did you find? Well, um, I found. Uh, First of all, I found word lists embedded in the malware that they had, which was great because I started the project for word lists. Word lists so, right. Yeah, so I took those. Uh, and uh, a couple of the other things I found were lists of the systems that they had hacked. In fact, after I started investigating some of the sites that they were downloading uh, files from, it was, you know, I, I saw EXEs, I saw Linux, uh, Linux viruses. And then I and then I saw just lists of uh, one of them was a list of a thousand machines that they had compromised. Now, obviously, I'm not a black hat, so I can't 
validate those, but based on the last modification date, it was a couple days old at that time. So I'm inclined to believe that, you know, out of those 1,000 systems, um, maybe, maybe if 100 or 50 worked, I, that would be an impressive grab, just out of thin air particularly. Mm. Uh, and actually a couple days ago, I was investigating some more ones, and I found a new list with 5,000, and then I found a SQL database that actually seems to contain a lot of PII. Interesting. So I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out who owns that so I can Contact. tell them. <laughs> Have you contacted anyone as a result of your investigations? You know, yes and no. Um, the uh, sometimes it's it's kind of hard to pinpoint who to um, who to report to, particularly when you're only based uh, going based off of IP and uh, you know, I, I, I'd go and, re, you know, reach out to the folks at, you know, if it's an Aaron registered address or if it's a, um, you know, AP NIC, uh, I, you know, I'd go out and reach them, um, or the ones that le- at least look uh, the juiciest. And of the people you've contacted, are they surprised? Are you the first person telling them about this? I haven't heard anything back. Oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering, I mean, because there's a lot of organizations that are doing what you're doing, right? Tracking uh, Mm -hmm. what's happening um, with with compromised hosts like that. And I'm kind of curious, like, what you think your success rate is uh, compared against some of the larger organizations that are doing very similar kinds of work. Yeah, right now it's it's zero. (laughs) But uh, what what I'm really interested to see is I, I, I just started getting hosts in other countries so uh, right now i only had hosts in uh, the u.s Aaron registered addresses so i know the representation for if you're an ip located in the u.s so now i've kind of started to branch out I've, I've got one in uh singapore now uh that's been running for a week uh that's that's been kind of going starting slowly uh and then i'm moving on to a uh, system in Russia and a system in Australia. So it's, you know, the ultimate goal of this is to be able to see the the different comparisons for different regions. So, you know, like I said in my talk, I wonder what's going to happen when I get a system in Hong Kong. Am I going to see Hong Kong attacking Hong Kong or am I going to see, you know, the majority the of the attackers yeah. coming from the U.S.? Right. Um have you observed any behavior that would indicate the attackers figured out that it was a Kippo honeypot? You know, it's funny. Uh, they don't have to do much because uh, I've made some modifications, yeah, but not too many. The there's a couple, you know, an if config, uh, excuse me, if config for example doesn't change. So you run if config a couple times, you know, you run if config. Type yes and let it run for five seconds, and then if you type if config again, you'd expect the amount of traffic to be yep. different from the first one and the second one. It's not. It doesn't. It's not. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's they could the, easily. Yeah. They could easily script something to make a detector like that. They could, and and that's the exact reason why I don't recommend running a honeypot on bandwidth-based services such as like Amazon Web Services, because mm-hmm. if someone you know detects that it's a honeypot on Amazon, even if they are unhappy that they've broken into one, uh, or they're you know oh okay well this isn't a system I can deal with. If they figure out you're on you know a, a system like that where it's it's bandwidth uh, bandwidth based, they can just start making traffic you mm-hmm. know come down from your machine. That's gonna cause a pretty painful bill. Have you seen anyone try to break out, or has anyone been successful in breaking out of the Kippo honeypot? Uh, not as of yet. Um, most, the, you know, mostly it's the same kind of attackers, uh, you know, using the same tricks, uh, right. simple scripts. Uh, I did see one, what was the recent attacker was actually really interesting. Uh, his script had a, uh, it had what appeared to be methods to delete other forms of malware. So there's like, there's a, there's a base of about, I've kind of come to understand the way they name a lot of the malware, at least a lot of the same attackers that keep coming back to my systems or the same, you know, they have this interesting naming scheme that's usually like four or five letters, but I see a lot of repeats uh, from different IPs, which would indicate that it's kind of a a group or collective of some sort. 
And what I've noticed is certain people logging on and actually running commands that remove names of malware that I've seen on from other sessions. Oh, so they're almost trying to go in and log in and delete the competition and and you know put their flag down. And so I mean that would mean that this is still a profitable activity for attackers. I mean you like to think that people set up systems on the internet that are listening on SSH that aren't. I mean it's mostly just guessing, password guessing, right? Yep. You like There's to think a lot people of, don't do yeah. that. But obviously people do if these attackers have done it so much that they know what the other guy's malware is named and they're removing it. Yeah, that was uh, pretty striking to see uh, a couple weeks ago. That was after actually after my talk. What else was uh, was in your talk that uh, you want to tell people about in terms of some of the uh, research you've done? Um, well, um, that's that's mostly it. Uh, you know, I, uh, what I what I'm looking to also do is right now it's only uh, an SSH service, so I'm doing SSH based honeypots, which are medium interaction, which let a user log in and run things, but there's all sorts out there, um, and you list a couple in your book as well. Um, there's uh, ones for internal, one for external, you know, other technologies besides SSH. Uh, you know, there's great SMTP honeypots that pretend to be an open mail relay, mm -hmm. and you can go and see what kind of uh, mail a spammer would be technically sending out. There's uh, others related to RDP. Um, I'm actually work. I I have a plan and kind of a high level idea on how I would like to make a RDP honeypot to record um, usernames and passwords mm -hmm. for uh, remote desktop. It's kind of complicated. It involves like two systems, you know, tr man in the middleing traffic to a system and routing routing traffic. But uh, yeah, those that's the extent of. Uh, that's the extent of the you know research thus far. <clears throat> uh, do you have recommendations for an organization that may want to use something like Kippo as part of their uh, defensive uh, technologies, or is it simply just a research tool? I mean, there's there's use cases for the corporate environment most definitely. It's uh, it allows a lot of customization um, and for. You know, if, it, if let's say a company put up a Kippo honeypot uh, on the external side, um, disclaimer: obviously, they're going to want to isolate it as heavily as possible, yep. um, just in case an attacker would be able to break out of it because it is running Python, and you know, it, it is possible that someone could break out of a honeypot if they were clever enough and they and they figured out um, how to do it. Yeah, and, and that and you have to you would somehow have to integrate those results, right? So mm -hmm. At some point, you have to go get the results, and inevitably that leaves a trace of something, a connection, or if you're sending mm -hmm. those logs off to somewhere else, that mm -hmm. IP address that you're sending off to is, is in there, and it, you don't want to give the attacker any information, right? Yeah. Um, but customization, you know, th that product, uh, which is free and uh, open source, uh, it can be used to... With uh, heavily customizations, I think my my, you know, my buddy, like I said in the talk, my buddy who works at a big IT firm. He uh, he had access to all these uh, big, heavy hitting systems, and I told him, I said, "Can you give me a CPU info and mem info just of a just a beast machine?" And a beast machine in my mind was like ah, two eight cores, you know, no hyper threading, you know, maybe thirty two gigs of RAM. And he's like, "That's all you want, you know? What are you emulating?" I'm like, "Ah, I'd love for it to look as beefy as possible." And he gives me. Uh, some mem info that's like half a terabyte, and a CPU info that's some uh, some blade that's got four 10 core hyper threaded processors on it, which wow. was not bad. <laughs> the attackers think they hit the jackpot with that one. Yeah, they do. Um, and uh, it, the uh, the last customization would be SSH pre logon banner. So that's a just the pre log. It fakes a pre logon banner for SSH. You know, you modify it to make it look like it's your company that they're breaking into. Yep. And they think they do, and let alone, you know, you have no idea that they actually haven't. Or they have no idea that they actually right. haven't. Cool. Uh, any, any more recommendations for folks that want to set up their own Kippo honeypot, whether for research, research or um, some, some type of uh, integration into your own defenses? Um, you, know, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter. Uh, me and uh, a couple of the other uh, 
definite uh, honeypot enthusiasts are working on some some really fun stuff. Uh, it honeypots were kind of a kind of a dead topic for a while. I know they I, you see a lot of you see a lot of stuff on them in the early two thousands, and there's the like a big gap from read, about. Is, sorry, sorry, oh. Elliot, we lost Joff, and we're trying to get him back. Oh no worries. <clears throat> sorry, continue. Um, you see, you see a lot of talk about them in the early two thousands, and there's a there's kind of a large gap between uh, two thousand five, two thousand seven, until a couple of years ago, where it wasn't really a discussed cop- topic. So mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to getting that word, you know, back in people's minds as as a potential for um, you know, uh, something something to use in the enterprise. Um, I've run into uh, I've run into a wireless security or a wireless honeypot before, a wireless router honeypot, um, and that caught me off guard really quickly. Mm. It oh, took so a little you, bit, but I figured yeah. it out. Yeah, you were on a penetration test and came across a wireless honeypot. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you find out what it was? Uh, it was a router that uh, didn't have any traffic on it. Um, or it had uh, some simulated traffic on it, and uh, it was it was designed uh, as kind of a perimeter uh, to you know look like something that an attacker should go after. When in reality, there were other networks as well. Yeah, I, I've struggled with the wireless honeypot scenario because I'm always afraid. No matter what you do, a real user is going to connect to the wireless honeypot. Well, there's no reason they need to be. <laughs> That's true, but if it's broadcast in the SSID, you know, I'm always afraid yeah. that like, regular users are going to end up connecting to that because they yeah. can't get on the other wireless for whatever. Yeah. So I, yeah. that's cool. I, I, I really like the fact that someone is attempting that. Yep. Um, I'm told that I need to ask you about your discoveries in your new iPhone. <laughs> yeah, that's because of Chris. Uh, I don't have any new discoveries. Oh I, well, I, I so okay. Tw- Chris had Chris is doing this because I tweeted uh, like uh, last Thursday that I had after being an Android user for six years, I now I'm a six plus user. Nice. How do you like the six plus? Mine's being delivered hopefully soon. Uh, it's uh, it's quite good. Uh, yeah, it feels like a really big phone at first, um, but uh, and it's slippery. It's like butter. This new iPhone's like uh, just absolute butter. It just falls out of your hand. Not uh, good. And I and I and the other ones had you know like that grip. Um, they had the edges, but they've made them so thin and and aluminum. But uh, you yeah. know, six plus with the leather leather case isn't too bad. Nice. And you can fold it and put it in your pocket, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a yeah, note. It's actually a flip phone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a Note three now, so the six plus is going to be. I think they're roughly the same size. Yeah, they're they're about the same size. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't go back to using a norm. What people deem as a normal size phone. Oh yeah, no. I I was a S three, and yeah. uh, that phone was a pretty decent size for me. And I I tried out the six plus, and I'm like, this is going to be obnoxiously big, and I'm going to get tired of it in, you know, a month because I can't one hand any uh, any of the activities. But you, you actually really get used to it. You do. I yeah. agree. People shouldn't shy away from the big phone. I no, thought the same thing about Jack's gigantic phone. I was like, yeah, I it's a small it's, tablet, dude. It, it, well, it depends on the size of your hand, but you can a lot. I, I don't know about the iPhone 6 Plus, but the, the Android or the Notes, you can shrink the keyboard and shift it to one side or the other. So if if the one handedness makes a, a big difference to you. But yeah, that's it's great. And if I'm sure you can't do that with the iPhone. I'm sure. You, I don't know. The iPhone's got all the features that you know uh, an, an S3 did two years ago. So it's true. Uh, it's true. <laughs> Very true. Oh, you can do. You got the little. Uh, you got the little double tap. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Then all the apps come down to the bottom. Uh, so One-handed use. Anytime you think the Note's too big or a Six Plus is too big, grab a uh, what is the Nokia, the 1520 Windows phone, because um, that's even bigger. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's it's. Wow, I mean it. It's like the Ron Jeremy of phablets. I think the the Nexus Six is going to be uh, that's got a six inch screen. I think it's even bigger. There's a new a new Note, the Note, not the Note Four, the Note the, Four. There's 
the the Nexus Six. Oh, Nexus Six is might slightly bigger, maybe. Yep. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. I think it's a. Yeah, it's a six-inch screen versus the average now, for like five four, five three. Yeah, I think it's so tough it's to even get bigger. A, tough to get a Nexus Nexus Six on a contract though. It depends on your yeah. provider. Either that, or you're gonna buy it outright for six hundred bucks. I don't know. I decided to go iPhone. I'm going back to iPhone. We'll see how that works Ooh. out. I did get a Samsung tablet, though, which I have to root to get rid of the bloatware. Because I, I still have to have Android. Well, and I, and I have a Nexus 5. I still have to have one of those, too. Yeah. Can we bring Joff back on? He said to loop him back in. I wanted to see if you had any questions for Elliot. So, Elliot, what else uh, have you uh, been working on? Nope. Um, you know, not too much. Uh, Honeypots is primarily, you know, primarily my, uh, primarily my, my forte. And, and, and that was right your now. that was your first talk at a security conference. Yep. And so, yep. I mean, I watched the video, but like, how was that? How did that go? Was everyone supportive and that kind of thing? Oh yeah. Um, you know, that was a. Uh, it was, uh, Rick, you know, I had gone to Gurkhan the year before, uh, but the conferences I've been to, my badges are uh, behind me. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Falcon in Chicago. Yep. Um, that was the first security conference that I went to. And then after that, it was uh, Gurkhan and DEF CON and B-Sides. And then I decided I want wanted to present at uh, a conference, and I figured, you know, Gurkhan was great because it, had a the size of the um, facilities is are really great, but the amount of people is 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 comfortable, mm. um, and you know a really great atmosphere. Um, you know everyone was very supportive, and uh, you know I, I admit you know walking around with the speaker badge was a lot of fun. You know I'm going outside, uh, and people are always you know commenting on the badge, and you know hey what are you talking about? And, you know, it's it's a lot of fun, and you know, you get to I got to collaborate and talk to a lot more people about what I was working on uh, than I had, you know, if I had gone as an attendee. So it was yeah, a that's, really that's a really great, great experience. That's really cool. I'm glad uh, it was a positive experience for you, and uh, yeah. everyone should check out Elliot's video. Uh, we'll try and uh, Chris, we can put a link in the show notes to uh, Elliot's uh, talk at Gurk. Oh wait, is it in there? It's in there already. I Imagine it's, that it's, in there. it's on IronGeek.com, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a link in the show notes to uh, to Elliot's talk, which I encourage everyone to check out. Um, Joff, are you there? I am. I'm back. Did you have questions for Elliot? I know you dropped off there for a little while. I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to ask Elliot questions. Actually, I don't right now, but thank you. Okay. Um, so now, Elliot, is the most difficult part of the interview where I ask you the five questions <coughs> on Security Weekly. Are you ready? I am ready. Three words to describe yourself. Ambitious, thinker, and I couldn't think of a way to put it, so I just said the word roar. Roar. I like it. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A Death Star. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I'm a big fan of The Office, so I'd have to go with uh, the one uh, that Michael Scott wrote called uh, Somehow I Manage. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. Conan O'Brien and Cleopatra. Nice. Wow. Nicely done. Well done, yes. So you're a Star Wars fan, Elliot? Yeah. Have you heard the rumor about the new movie? No, but uh, Daniel Radcliffe was uh, actually just on uh, Conan talking about uh, he was on the set. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I heard a rumor that the storyline was going to be like Luke's powers of the Force get so powerful that he has to exile himself, and then things happen and he has to come back and like set things straight. Which, to me, I don't know, my kids love the movie Frozen. Yeah. Sounds exactly I, I like the plot <laughs> to the movie Frozen. <laughs> Go Disney! Yay! <laughs> so I am not excited about the new Star Wars movie after hearing it. Hopefully it's just a rumor. There's plenty of time know, to that, work that, that, Yeah. Yeah. That isn't, aren't That's Disney people we're supposed to be creative? We're get, yeah, we're, we're, we're also getting towards Harry Potter, Elder Wand... 
too powerful yet. Yeah, yeah it's just that's a bad storyline, in my opinion. Well, I was really, I was really hoping for it. a fourth good Star Wars movie. Yeah. Well, there was oh, only three. That there was only three good ones. Yeah. <laughs> that should ins- that should inflame a few people. Would you say uh, Elliot, there's going to be a Millennium Falcon? <laughs> Falcon in it? Yeah, they they confirmed uh, the Millennium Falcon's going to be in this this one. Well, at least we have that to look forward to. Yeah, at least. All righty. Well, Elliot, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thanks very much. And uh, with that, we will take a short break. Come back with the stories for this what? week. Oh yeah. <laughs> 